Hello, today we're continuing in our series on nuclear physics looking at the collective model and the vibrational and rotational aspects of nuclei. Just before we get into this, I just want to do something by way of a review of how you combine the angular momenta of two nucleons. So what we're talking about is um, one nucleon that has a particular J value. J, remember, is always equal to L plus S. So J is the combination of the orbital angular momentum and the spin angular momentum. And what we're talking about is two nucleons each having a J value, J1 and J2. And I'm just reminding you how you combine them. The answer is that you can get a maximum angular momentum by combining them so that they are both aligned. That will give you the maximum. The minimum is if you align them opposite. So if the two nucleons align in terms of their total angular momentum in opposite ways, that's the minimum value. But you don't only have those two values because, of course, you can have options where the alignments are, as it were, not entirely aligned. However, this cannot be continuous. There is not an infinite number of these because each of these alignments has to differ from the previous by one H bar. That is the consequence of quantum mechanics. Everything is in quantized jumps and that's an integer value of H bar. So consequently, if, for example, J1 is 3 and uh, J2 is 1, then the maximum value you can have is 4, 3 plus 1. These are all H bar, of course. Again, if it's 3 and 1, then the minimum value you can have is 2. 3 minus 1 is 2. But you can also have a value of 3 in the middle because you go up by units of h bar, 1 h bar. So you can go from 2 h bar to 3 h bar to 4 h bar. And we don't, we drop the h's and so we say that the states are 2, 3 and 4. Similarly, if for example j doesn't have to be a whole value, it can be a half value. So let's say that the values are 5 over 2 and 1 over 2. Well, then the maximum value is going to be 5 over 2 plus 1 over 2, which is 6 over 2, which is 3. The minimum value is going to be, from here, 5 over 2 minus 1 over 2, which is 4 over 2, which is 2. And now there cannot be anything in the middle because you have to go up in steps of 1. So the only two options for combined angular momentum is a 3-state or a 2-state. So let's go back to uh, where the story uh, left off. We were arguing that for even, even nuclei, that is to say an even number of neutrons and an even number of protons, all the neutrons and all the protons are able to pair because there's an even number. And where you've got paired uh, nucleons, they will pair in such a way that the angular momentum of that pair will be zero and that the magnetic moment will be zero because those are the lowest energy states. Consequently, since in an even, even nucleus, all the nucleons can be paired, the total angular momentum of an even, even nucleus ought to be zero. And therefore the ground state, that is the one of lowest energy, should be what's called a zero plus state. It is an angular momentum of zero because they've all paired up to achieve that and the parity is plus. And that is by and large what you find with even even nuclei. The ground state is zero plus. But what we then said, and this was the extreme particle, a single particle model, that as far as even odd is concerned, Incidentally, there are very few stable odd-odd nuclei, and I haven't worried about those at the moment. But for even-odd, that means that on the even side, you've got a complete number of pairs, so that should give you a total angular momentum of zero. On the odd side, apart from one nucleon, all the others will pair, and that will give you a total angular momentum of zero. So the angular momentum of the 
nucleus we have alleged with the extreme single particle model is wholly down to the one unpaired nucleon, the guy who's on his own, and he will determine the uh, ground state of the uh, nucleus. So here I've drawn the shell levels from the shell model, from the earlier video we did on the shell model, taking into account the spin orbit coupling. These are the lowest energy rising to the highest energy. And I want to consider the element calcium 41. Calcium has 20 protons, but in this particular case, it usually has 20 neutrons, but in this particular element, it has 21 neutrons. 20 protons means it's an even number, which means all of them will pair and will give you an angular momentum, total angular momentum of zero. That's the theory. But what about the 21, um, 21 neutrons that we've got to use? Well, 20 of them can pair. And how did they do that? Well, remember, we can fill these levels. How many nucleons can we get in each level? The solution was a fairly straightforward one. You take the upper part of the fraction and add one, and that gives you the total number of nucleons that can get into that level. So you've got two here, you've got three plus one is four, one plus one is two, five plus one is six, one plus one is two, and three plus one is four. And if you add that up, two plus four is six, plus two is eight, plus six is 14, plus two is 16, plus four is 20. That is a magic number. Well, remember you said that we said that there were certain magic numbers in the shells of the shell model where that was, as it were, a complete uh, batch. And all of these are paired, so all of these will have a net angular momentum of zero. But then there's one extra neutron. Ordinarily, for calcium um, 40, you would have 20, 20, 20 neutrons, 20 protons, They'd all be paired, the total angular momentum would be zero. But here, we've got one extra neutron, and that extra neutron must sit in the 1F7 over 2 level, which means, according to our model, that the ground state of this element, or this nucleus of this element, is going to be the 7 over 2. So the ground state you'd expect to find to be angular momentum 7 over 2, and is the parity plus or minus? Well, remember, for parity plus, you need L values of 0, 2, 4, 6, and so on. And for parity minus, you need L values of 1, 3, 5. So if it's an even value of L, it's a positive parity. If it's an odd value of L, it's a negative parity. And we are talking about an F level here. And F, S, P, D, S, P, D, F means that L is equal to 3, which is odd. So that means it's a 7 over 2 minus ground state. Now the question is, what are the excited states of this uh, nucleus? That is to say, if you put energy in to the nucleus, what might happen? Well, what might happen, of course, is that this neutron, which is sitting at this level, might be elevated to this level. And that would be a 3 over 2 state, because it's 2p, 3 over 2. And what would the um, parity be? Well, it's a p state. p is equal to L is 1, so that's minus. So you might think that the, uh, the first excited state of this nucleus would be the neutron going up to the next level, which would be 3 over 2 minus. And that is exactly what you find. Well, what about the second excited state? Well, you might think that the neutron will now go up to the next level. And that would be a 5 over 2. And what is F? S, P, D, F. That's L is 3. So that is a minus as well. So you might expect to find a 5 over 2 minus state here. But actually, you don't you find a 3 over 2 plus state. And that is because nature, of course, is always looking for the next easiest route. And the next easiest route is to actually leave the isolated neutron in the 1F7 over 2 shell, break a pair here, 
so that you've got a pair and then one isolated neutron and elevate the other one to the 1f7 over 2 level. So effectively of these four, you keep one pair and then the other pair you break. So you leave an isolated neutron in this level, push the other one up because it's an excited state to the 1f7 over 2. These two can now produce a pair. So they have a combined angular momentum of zero and therefore the whole nucleus is going to be determined by the angular momentum of that one uh, isolated neutron that's been left in the D3 over 2 shell. And what is that? That's going to be 3 over 2, so that's okay. And what's D? S, P, D, that means L equals 2, which means it's positive parity. So that explains that particular uh, exc excitation level as opposed to the what you might have expected, which was the 5 over 2 minus level. Well, now let's look at even, even nuclei. And the nucleus I'm going to consider is argon, argon 38. Argon has 18 protons, and therefore by definition it must have 20 um, neutrons. And 20, remember, is a magic number. So, um, all of these are going to be paired so they, you would expect the total angular momentum of each pair to be zero, and therefore you would expect the ground state of argon to be zero plus, positive parity, um, and ground state of zero, zero angular momentum, because all of those even numbers of neutrons, neutrons and protons are going to pair up. So no problem. So what is the ground state going to be as far as the protons is concerned. We know that the neutrons are going to have their 20 neutrons, they're going to fill up the first 20 states, or the first states up to 20 nucleons, and that's a magic number. But let's just think first of all about the protons, 18 of them. So once again we're using the rule that you can have 1 plus the number at the top of the fraction, so we're going to get 2 here, we're going to get 4 here, we're going to get 2 here, we're going to get 6 here, we're going to get 2 here. And that makes a total of 6, 8, 14, 16. But we've got 18. So that means we're going to have two more protons in a shell, which could take four, but it is in fact only taking two. They're still paired, so no problem. And the total angular momentum is going to be uh, zero. Now the question is, you put some energy into this nucleus, what is the first excited state going to be? And you might think, well, what's going to happen now is that what will happen when the energy comes in is the energy will break this pair. And then having broken the pair, it will elevate one of those protons to the higher level. But now we can't just look at one isolated proton because there are now two. There is the one that's been promoted, and there's the one that's been left behind. And the angular momentum of both of those are going to have an impact. So the rule is that you can add and subtract the angular momentum and then have quantized levels in between. That's what we did at the beginning of this video. So that means that we've got one uh, proton that has a 7 over 2 angular momentum on its own. And we've now, because we've broken the pair, we've now got one with a 3 over 2 angular momentum on its own. So you can add the two together to get 10 over 2, which is 5. So that's one option. Or you can subtract them. 7 over 2 minus 3 over 2 is, what's that, 4 over 2 is 2, which means that the options are all integers in between, so 2, 3, 4, and 5 are the possible excited states if this is what is happening, if this is what is happening. And what will the parity be? Well, the parity will be a combination of F and D levels. S, P, D, F, that's L is 3, that's minus. Uh, S, P, D, that's L is 2, that's plus. A plus and a minus always gives you a minus, so these will always be minus states. The rule with combining parity is plus, plus, plus is a plus, 
Minus and a minus is a plus, but plus and a minus is a minus. So here we've got, as I've said, an F state, SPDF is L is three, that's odd. Uh, SPD L is two, that's even. Even plus odd is odd. And that's why you get those minus states. So it looks like the first excited state of argon 38 should be one of those. We don't know which one because we don't know which is going to be nature's preferred. But surely one of them will be the first excited state. Uh, but it isn't. The first excited state is a 2 plus. And in fact, the first excited state of nearly all even even nuclei is 2 plus. And that's not one of these. Well, OK, uh, we can think of, we can sort that out. We can work that out. We've just broken the wrong pair, that's all. Let's suppose that nature keeps these two as a pair. And instead it splits up this pair. That will leave us will, with one odd nucleon here and the other one we promote into this shell. We can do that because remember this shell can hold a maximum of four nucleons and it's only got two in it. So what we've now got is these two which stay as a pair so their angular momentum is zero. And then we've got one left in this shell and one in this shell. So we've got one in the 2s a half shell and one in the 1d three halves shell. So what now are our angular momentum opportunities? Remember we've got a half and three halves. So what we can do is to add the two together, half plus three halves, that's going to give us two. Or we can minus, and you always take the, um, the smallest from the largest. That's going to be one. So those are the only two options, two and one. And what parity will they be? Well, you're going from an S, which is L equals zero, to a D, which is L equals two. So you've got two lots of positives. So these will both be plus. So maybe we've, got, we've now got a two plus option and maybe that's what that first excited state is. Maybe what we've done is to split uh, these two in the 2s half level, elevated one, left the other one where it is, and then the total angular momentum is the combination of the two isolated nucleons. And since they both come from positive parity um, shells, that will give us the two plus. Maybe that is true. Now we turn to experimental results, which of course always trump any of our theories. You always have to amend your theory so that it accords with the experimental results. And what I'm going to measure is the energy of the first excited state in an even even nucleus, which I've said in nearly all cases is a two plus state. And the energy will be the scale is 1 to 2 MeV, and along here we've got the A number, the total nucleons. So out here you've got something like 250. So, and this only applies to even, even nuclei, we forget the even odd, and what you will get is a shape that looks something like this. Obviously I'm just drawing it freehand, so it's not that accurate. This is when the number of nucleon, neutrons is equal to 50. Um, then you come down again and you go up to, this is where n is 82. That's uh, again another magic number. Then you find it goes right down very low. Then it comes back up again to where n equals 126. That's a magic number of course. And then it sort of drifts off again like this. This very, very low point, which we'll come to a little bit later, operates between 150 and 190, when A is between 150 and 190, where this energy here is less than 100 keV. Right, so less than a tenth of an MeV. And you'll notice that apart from when you've got the magic numbers, when, as you might expect, the energies are going to be, uh, all of these are going to be very tightly bound because these are magic numbers. But apart from that, um, the sort of average of that first excited state, which is a two plus state in even even nuclei, 
is broadly of the order of 1 MeV, broadly. Now, here's our problem. Our problem is, if we're going to start explaining that first excited state by this kind of idea that you take the 2s half, you, you break the bond, you break the pair, you elevate one of them, the fact is you need energy of the order of 2 MeV to do that, to break a pair and elevate one of those pair needs about 2 MeV. But the experimental result suggests that actually the first excited state is at too low an energy to allow that to happen. So there must be something else that's going on. Does that mean we should throw the shell model away? Not a bit of it. It's doing very well. You just need to take into account of other things. And the other things we need to take into account are what are called the collective uh, workings of the nucleus, which give rise to what we call the collective model. What the collective model says is it's not just the individual isolated nucleon in the odd even, or the two, as it were, separated nucleons in the even even, that are determining the characteristic of the nucleus. Sometimes it can be the entire nucleus acting as a whole that can have an effect. And this is where we think of the nucleus rather like a liquid drop. There is such a thing as a liquid drop model. We have mentioned it before. But if you think of a nucleus as a liquid drop, you know that you could come along and you could squash it. And if you squash it, you'd get a sort of flattened sphere. Or you could squash it from the sides, in which case you'd get uh, a squashed sphere in that direction. These are all rather extreme squashings, but you get the point. Well, if you first squash it up and down to give this, and then you squash it side to side to give this, what you'll do is you'll get an oscillation between the two, or a vibration. So essentially this sphere will first oscillate like this, and then it will oscillate like that. And again, as I'm saying, it's very extreme versions that I'm doing here. In fact, it's more a kind of wobble. But it's a wobble that goes between a squashed in this direction and a squashed in this direction. And that's called vibrational energy, the vibration of the nucleus. And what is happening, of course, is that all the nucleons within that nucleus are themselves vibrating. And that is contributing to the angular momentum of those nucleons. Now it turns out that L equals zero, the uh, angular momentum equals zero, is just a non-vibrating spherical nucleus. L equals one is actually equa equating to the nucleus actually oscillating up and down rather like a weight on a spring. It just, it just oscillates like that, that's the L equals one but there's no change within the nucleus itself. This is just a pure translational change. One point the nucleus is here, the next point the nucleus is here, and it simply vibrates between the two. It doesn't have any effect in terms of energy levels within the nucleus itself. The first vibration which affects the nucleus is this one, and that's the L equal two vibration. You can consider, these are all of course very classical concepts and we're talking quantum mechanics. You could consider a third, a so-called L equals three oscillation. And that's where the nucleus oscillates kind of in a three-way mode. So when those three points are coming in, these three points are going out. So it's it's kind of wobbling in and out on a, on a kind of a three-way wobble. This is a two-way wobble. This is a three-way wobble. So we've got angular momentum L equals two, L equals three. You could go higher, but we're not going to. And now we say that energy, as we know, is always quantized. And what is the lowest energy you can have? Well, it's H bar omega. Remember, E equals HF, or you can write it as H bar omega, where omega is the angular frequency, 2 pi times the frequency. And if we're talking about 
the L equals 2 mode, that's this one, then we're talking about the frequency with which this nucleus wobbles or vibrates, and that is given by omega L equals 2. I'll put that in brackets. So we're talking about the frequency associated with L equals 2. And that is one packet of vibrational energy, the smallest you can get. You can't get smaller than that because it's quantized. If that were light, we would call it a photon. But here we call it a phonon. One phonon of energy. What would the next vibrational energy be? Well, it has to be quantized, so it's got to be 2 h bar omega, where we're talking about still the L equals 2, uh, and, uh, the L equals 2 vibration. And that, of course, is two phonons. And then we could talk about E equals 3 h bar omega for the L equals 2 vibration, and that's the equivalent of three phonons. And what you would expect, obviously, is that the energy of this, would, or rather the energy of this is three times the energy of this, the energy of this is two times the energy of this. All right, so that energy level would be twice that energy level. What is the angular momentum of this first uh, excitation, which would presumably be the first excited state? Well, that's going to be two. Why? Because L equals two, that's angular momentum. What will the uh, parity be? Well, L equals 2 is an even number, so that's going to give you a plus. What about here? What is the uh, ground state? Well, sorry, what is the excited state here? This is the, essentially the second excited state. Well, you've got two lots of 2 plus. And how do you, sorry, you've got two lots of 2. So how do you do that? You can remember you can align that way, or you can align that way, or you can have even numbers in between. So if each of these is 2, 2 plus 2 is 4, but 2 minus 2 is 0. So the options here are that you could have everything in units of 1 from 0 to 4. So you could have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And what will the parity be? Well, L is 2 in each case. So you've got positive, two lots of positives are positive. So in theory, in practice, there's a reason why you can't necessarily have all those states. But in theory, the first excited state would be a 2+, plus, which is good, because if you remember, I said that the excited states of even-even nuclei are nearly always 2+. Plus. So that's good, isn't it? That's given us that. And then the next excited state could, in theory, be anything from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4+. Plus. What about 3? Well, you've got three lots of L equals 2, which means your maximum is going to be 6. And as it happens, the minimum, for reasons we don't need to worry too much about, is 0. And then, of course, you can have quantized numbers for all of them. And what will the parity be? Plus, again, because you've got L equals 2, which is positive parity. Three lots of positive parity is positive. So, in theory, the third excited state could be any one of those. And that was all for the L equals 2 vibration with increasing energy. But they always had to increase in units of h-bar. Well, what about the L equals 3 wobble or vibration? Well, the L equals 3 wobble or vi vibration is going to give you an energy. The first of those is going to be h bar omega, but this time it's omega associated with the L equals 3 level. And that's going to be one phonon, but at the L equals 3 level, what state is that going to be? Well, the angular momentum is 3, because L is 3, and L is odd, therefore the parity is minus. So that will give you a 3 minus state. I can tell you that the energy of the first excited state of an L equals 3 vibration is broadly kind of equivalent to and in the same sort of order of magnitude as the energy of the second excited state of the vibration when L is 2. They are broadly comparable in energy. So you might expect to find a 3 minus state mixed up with 
some of these uh, plus states. So let's look at the experimental results. And let's look at argon, 38 argon. And the ground state, of course, you will expect to be naught plus because it's um, even, even. And uh, this is, I think, 18. So there are 18 protons, 20 neutrons, even, even. All of the neutrons in the ground state are going to pair up to achieve zero angular momentum. So the ground state is going to be zero plus, which it certainly is. What you then find experimentally is that the first excited state at about 2.17 MeV is a 2 plus level. The next excited state is a 3 minus, and that's at 3.77 MeV. And then the next one above that is the 2 plus, which is 3.95 MeV. Now, is that consistent with what we've been saying so far? Well, it certainly is, because this would be equal to the L equals 2, 1 phonon state. In other words, E equals H bar omega L equals 2. Then this one, the, the next um, 2 plus, is equivalent to L equals 2, but this time with the two phonons, E equals 2 h bar omega. Can I fit it in? 2 h bar omega, where omega is again the L equals 2 level. So you'd expect this energy to be twice this. And it sort of broadly is. It's not quite, because obviously we've not got the complete solution yet. But it broadly, you know, that's okay. And what about this 3 minus here? Well, that was the L equals 3, 1 phonon. E equals 1 h bar omega, but this time for L equals 3. So argon is starting to give us energy levels which are associated not with breaking pairs within argon, but rather associated with the collective motion of the entire nucleus as it vibrates. So when there's no vibration, you're in the ground state, you get a naught plus. When you give the uh, nucleus a little bit of energy, you get your first excited state, which is the L equals 2 vibration wobble with the lowest possible energy. And then if you give it a bit more energy, the next excited state is the L equals 3 wobble, but just with one phone on of that. And then very shortly after that, the L equals 2, 2 phone on state. You get a little bit more energy, you get two phonons in the L equals 2 state. And I did tell you, if you remember, that the first excited state of L equals 3 was broadly comparable to the second excited state of the L equals 2. And that's sort of what we're seeing here. So, so far, we're starting to explain the energy levels in terms of vibrations of the nuclei. And just to save a bit of time, I've drawn the excited states of the element tellurium-120, which is an even, even nucleus. Ground state, of course, is naught plus, as you'd expect. All the pairs pair up. The first excited state, 2 plus, is at about half an MeV. Then you get three excited states, naught plus, 2 plus, and 4 plus, at about 1 MeV. And then you get four excited states, naught plus, 6 plus, 4 plus, and 4 3 minus at about uh, one and a half, just over MeV. Is this consistent with the vibrational model? Yes. This, of course, would be the L equals 2, one phonon, lowest possible energy. This, of course, is entirely consistent with L equals 2, two phonons, and therefore should be twice the energy of this. And is it? Yeah, one is about twice half, so that looks good. And then this, at least these three, would be consistent with L equals 2, 3 phonons. So 3 times the energy of the first excited state, that's about right, 1.5 MeV. This 3 minus, that's a bit of a puzzle. It really ought to be, if it's the 3 minus associated with the first excited state of L equals 3, it ought to be sort of somewhere here. But hey, we can't explain everything. What we, can, what we can do is to say, this is looking good as far as a vibrational model is concerned. But here's the problem. 
This is the ground and excited states for the element tungsten, tungsten 174, an even, even nucleus. Here's the ground state, and then the excited states in order in which they come are 2 plus, 4 plus, 6 plus, 8 plus, 10 plus, and the 2 plus is only about 100 keV above the ground state. And you've got 2 plus, 4 plus, 6 plus, 8 plus, 10 plus, and the gaps between them widen increasingly. And that is not consistent with the vibrational model. But we remember something. 174 falls within 150 and 190. And if you remember on a graph I showed you before, something rather odd happens in that range. The first excited state of all the even, even nuclei in that range is of the order of 100 keV, very, very low. Now further experimental results come to our aid. If you plot the quadrupole moment of, I should actually put that line there, that zero, this is something like minus two, this is the quadrupole moment of uh, even, even nuclei, so A number is going along here, what you find is that the quadrupole moment sort of oscillates about the zero point until you get to A is 150, and it suddenly shoots down here like that, and then it goes back up, and it sort of does something like this. But this is about the 150 to the 190 level. Of course, tungsten at 174 sits in that range. And what does a quadrupole moment that suddenly shoots down to minus two mean? It means that these nuclei are spherical, but uh, these nuclei are non-spherical. They won't be quite as non-spherical as that, but I draw it as a squashed orange just to make a point. Now, what is relevant about that? Well, what is relevant about that is that if I take a sphere this represents a sphere, and I rotate it by 90 degrees, it becomes a sphere. No change. But if I take a squashed sphere and I rotate it by 90 degrees, it definitely changes. And that suggests that there can be such a thing as rotational energy. And we go back to our classical mechanics. We shouldn't really, of course, because this is all quantum mechanics, but this is illustrative. What in quantum mechanics is the energy of a rotating, rigid rotating body? If you want to see more, look at my videos on the dynamics of rigid rotating bodies in the classical mechanics playlist. But the energy, well, the energy of a body normally, the kinetic energy would be half mv squared where m would be its mass and v would be its linear velocity. But when you've got a rotating body, it's slightly different. It becomes a half i omega squared, where i is called the moment of inertia, it kind of is the mass term as far as uh, rotation is concerned, and omega is the orbital, sorry, the angular velocity rather than the linear velocity. And we also showed in that series that the total angular momentum is equal to i omega, the moment of inertia, times the angular velocity. And that means that i is equal to L over omega from here. And if you stick that in there, you find that the total energy is given by L squared divided by 2i, the angular momentum squared divided by twice the uh, moment of inertia. Now we kind of drift back into quantum mechanics a bit and remind ourselves that L squared, the operator, is L into L plus one H bar squared. And that means that our total energy is going to be L into L plus one times H squared divided by two I. Now for any uh, given um, nucleus, as it were, h bar squared over the twice the moment of inertia is going to be a constant, so this term here we can just regard as a constant value multiplied by L times L plus 1. So let's think what the energy is going to be 
when L is zero. The energy is going to be zero times one, which is zero. When L is one, the energy is going to be one times two, which is two. Always multiplied by this constant here, but we're just looking at units at the moment. When L is two, E is going to be two times three, which is six. When L is three, the energy is going to be three times four is 12. I think you're getting the pattern here. When L is four, the energy is going to be four times five is 20 units. When L is six, the energy is going to be six times seven, 42 units. I don't need to go any further, I think, because uh, you can get the pit and whatever L is, you multiply L by L plus one gives you this number here. Now, turns out that for rotational energy, you have to keep the wave function, we are in quantum mechanics terms um, after all, you have to keep the same wave function, which means the wave function does not become negative. And that means that parity must be positive. So in all of this, parity must be positive. And parity is only positive for L equals zero, two, four, six, all the even numbers. It's not positive for L equals one, three, five, and so on. So these are not allowed. We have to, actually I missed out uh, L equals five. Um, perhaps I did that, that's a Freudian mistake. L equals five would of course give you an energy of five times six, which is 30. So there should have been an L equals five option in there, but actually what we've just shown is you can't have it anyway, so it goes. So I've just written it out again with now only even values of L, which are the only ones which are allowed, and the associated energy in units, of course, of h bar squared divided by 2i, where i is the, angular, is the moment of inertia. And these are the L values. So the L value, and they're all positive, so this is going to be 0 plus, that's going to be the 2 plus, that's going to be the 4 plus, that's going to be the 6 plus, that's going to be the 8 plus, and that's going to be the 10 plus. And if we draw that in energy terms, and I'll try and draw it here, if this is the naught plus here, then you go up six and you get to two plus because there are six units. Then between these two, there's 14, right? So that distance is six, but the next distance is more. It's 14 and that gets you to the four plus level. Between these two are 22, so it goes up even more and that gets you to the six plus level. Between these two is 30. So you go up even more, 30, and that gets you to the eight plus level. And then between these two is I think 38. So you go up even more, and that gets you to the 10 plus level. So what this suggests is that when you're talking about rotational energy, you start with the ground state where there's no energy at all, and then you go up by progressively larger amounts in uh, even numbers of uh, angular momentum and all states being even parity. And isn't that precisely what I gave you as the experimental result for 174 tungsten? So it looks like the first uh, at least five excited states of tungsten can be accounted for not by breaking pairs, which is the extreme single particle, mo particle model, not by vibrations, because the energies are too high even for that, but by very low energy rotations, simply because the tungsten nucleus is non-spherical. If it's spherical, rotation wouldn't make any difference. But if it's non-spherical, you can get these lower level energy uh, changes so that excited states in the initial stages are all down to rotations. Experimentally, if you look at the uh, elements in the 150 to uh, 190 range, you find that if you take the first four plus level and you divide it by the first two plus level, you get 3.3. That is the ratio of the energy at the force plus level and the energy at the two plus level. Does that make sense here? What is the energy at the four plus level? It's 20, it's six plus 14, 20. 
What is the energy at the 2 plus level 6? So it's 20 divided by 6. Hey, doesn't that come to 3.3? How handy. So let's just summarise where we've got to. If we draw the energy 0, 1, 2 MeV, we take our ground state 0 plus, and that's going to have no or lowest energy, not necessarily zero energy, but lowest energy. What we're saying is that if the nucleus is in the range 150 to 190, it's non-spherical, you can have some very low energy rotational excited states. Then you can have vibrational states, which account for energy levels. So if, you've, if you're not in the 150 to 190 range, this doesn't apply and the first excited states will be accounted for by vibrations. And then the shell model starts taking over, producing energy levels which are accounted for by the isolated nucleon or in some cases broken pairs of nucleons and they produce the yet still higher energy levels uh, which we see in some nuclei. So excited states are either due to rotational energy, but only for a small uh, range of nuclei, vibrational energy, and then the standard shell model energy that we've discussed before. And this is a matter of some interest to me because this was actually the subject of my thesis when I did my PhD. The title of the thesis is The Interaction of Helium-3 Ions with the samarium isotopes. And I looked at various samarium isotopes. You may not be able to see this terribly clearly, but these show the five samarium isotopes I looked at. 144 samarium, 148 samarium, 150 samarium, 152 samarium, and 154 samarium. And what is important about that? They are on either side of the A equals 150 line. So in other words, below that, you would expect them not to be rotational, but beyond that, you would expect them to be rotational. These are the excited states in each case. And look, 154 samarium has got some very low excited states, as indeed is 152. 150, which is at the point at which you get the transition, the states are a bit higher. But when you look at 148 and 144, the energy levels start to be much higher. In particular, 144 is probably all vibrational, no rotation at all. So by examining how particles scatter off of each of those isotopes, you can get a very good feel for the way in which vibrational and rotational issues are taken into account as far as the nuclear potential is concerned.